Thank, thank, thank you very much for that. Alan was too generous. It's a, it's a great honor to be introduced by Alan Jones. Um, you know, Alan and I have something in common. When we go on the ABC, they, uh, they put a health warning on us. <laughs> Con controversial conservative Alan Jones, controversial conservative Mark Stein. Uh, you know, and frankly, there's a lot of people in Melbourne who think we shouldn't be here tonight. Uh, so I was very touched uh, this morning, passing the Melbourne Arts Centre, uh, to see that some ladies had climbed up the spire and hung a big banner saying, let them stay. Uh, <laughs> Alan, Alan and I, Alan and I, thank you. That was, that was very moving. And, uh, if, if those ladies are here tonight, because I understand they came down from the tower about uh, 40 minutes before we came in here, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. <laughs> lovely, lovely sentiment. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be back with uh, John Roscombe and the uh, rest of the gang at the IPA, and I thank them very much. Uh, the IPA, as we've heard, are in the freedom business, and we need more people in the freedom business in Australia and the rest of the West. Uh, I, was, I was last here uh, four prime ministers ago. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that's about six months. Um, it was before Malcolm knifed Tony and uh, back when either Julia was knifing Kevin or Kevin was knifing Julia. I forget which it was. And it's a sobering thought that until Kevin Rudd, uh, if I'd said I was last here four prime ministers ago, uh, we'd have been back to Sir Robert Menzies. It's uh, uh, John Howard, uh, Bob Hawke, um, Malcolm Fraser. Yeah, I intentionally left out Paul Keating. <laughs> and so should you. Um, uh, Guff Whitlam, and uh, I think I left out the, uh, the fellow who left his clothes on the beach, uh, Harold, uh, Harold Holt. Um, uh, but we're in the ballpark, and uh, I'd, like, I'd like, actually, I'd like Kevin and Julia to leave their clothes on the beach <laughs> and just like uh, swim out to sea, punching each other in the kisser and, and, and spilling each other as the waves wash over them on the far horizon. Um, last time I spoke in Melbourne at the IPA, uh, I, sp I, I spoke actually, on, I was on stage, I shared the stage with Tony Abbott, um, and he was the coming man back then, and, uh, you know, so I put him in the old Rolodex, useful, useful chap to know, and in between my two Melbourne appearances, uh, the coming man came and went. Somebody... Uh, uh, Bob Day said um, that uh, I'd compared Australia to the Soviet Union, which I don't think I, 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 I don't think I actually did. But there's a line in the Fred Astaire movie Silk, Sock Silk Stockings, in which one Soviet commissar is discussing with another Soviet commissar what's happened to a third Soviet commissar, and he says, "I'll look him up in Who's Still Who," <laughs> and. Uh, that's Australian politics. Uh, <laughs> I'll look him up in Who's Still Who. Um, uh, I, also, I also should thank Bob Day for his commitment to rid the world of, uh, of Section 18C, which again is what I was <clears throat> speaking about. You know, before one speaks to a, a, an audience such as yourselves, a prudent man uh, goes to the library and uh, looks up uh, 10 can't miss tips for public speakers and right up at the front they advise you to open up with a light-hearted observation so people know it's uh, not going to be a lot of heavy stuff and uh, that's what Professor Sir Tim Hunt uh, fellow of the Royal Society did last year he's, he's a Nobel laureate he's a genuine one not a pretend one like uh, the guy who's suing me uh, the, uh, the, hockey, the hockey stick inventor who's, uh, whose name escapes me <laughs> Because uh, frankly, with my legal bills, I have a right to forget his name, I think. And uh, last year, Sir Tim was in Seoul, South Korea, for some science conference, and he was required to make a few remarks. So he began with an ill advised attempt at warming up the room. Uh, quote, Let me tell you about my trouble with girls. Three things happen when they are in the lab. 
You fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. <laughs> not the funniest joke in the world. <laughs> That's why you should hire a professional and not try it yourself. Uh, but the, uh, the genius of a scientist is often inversely proportional to his social ease. Uh, <laughs> So, Sir Tim did not anticipate that a throwaway line about how girls are so emotional about these things uh, would result in the girls getting so emotional about these things. <laughs> While he was on the flight back to London, his life was destroyed. Over. He lost everything. His professorship, his Royal Society committee ships, all of it gone because of 12 seconds in a glorious half century of scientific brilliance. There's a, there's a section in one of my books called Last Laughs, in which I write about a novel called The Joke, Milan Kundera's uh, great tale of the pitfalls of ideologically unsound gags in communist Eastern Europe, in which a man makes a very mild throwaway joke and his entire life is ruined. And that's how we in the free world used to think about the communist world. They were the guys who policed jokes. Uh, at the time of Stalin's death in 1953, there were over 200,000 prisoners in Soviet labor camps who'd been convicted of telling jokes of which the regime did not approve. And we laugh because we're free and they're not. But in fact, the world of Milan Kundera, in which a guy's life is destroyed for the wrong joke, is alive and well in the supposed free West. We don't send you to labor camp for the joke, not yet, but we are willing to destroy your life completely for a non-ideologically compliant gag, as has happened to Sir Tim Hunt and others. There's something ugly and tyrannous in the air, and I don't use that term lightly. Uh, 50 years ago, everyone was hopping mad because in the American South, they had separate drinking fountains and bus seats for blacks and whites. Now we've got rid of all that bad segregation, and we have good segregation. At the Queensland University of Technology, we have separate computer labs for aboriginals, because uh, apparently they have a separate Windows operating program <laughs> that non-aboriginals couldn't possibly figure out. I don't know what, I don't know what that is. But the, we have at British Municipal Swimming Baths, we have sex-segregated swimming sessions for Muslims. And the British Labour Party hosts events where the men and women sit in separate sections. And if you make an offhand gag about any of this, you will be investigated uh, as these Queensland, Queensland students uh, are currently being uh, following a complaint made under Section 18C. Uh, the uh, law that Bob Day spoke about. Tyranny is always capricious, and you can fall afoul of it no matter how hard you try to keep up. At Wellesley College in Massachusetts, a girl student who identifies as a, quote, masculine of center genderqueer, unquote, <laughs> named Timothy. Oh, by the way, are there any masculine of center genderqueers here tonight? <laughs> Yes, uh, you, madam, at the back with the full bed. <laughs> a masculine of center genderqueer named Timothy, uh, who prefers to be referred to by male pronouns, and uh, she was told she could no longer run for coordinator of the School Office of Multicultural Affairs because she was now a white male and therefore insufficiently diverse to be a diversity officer. <laughs> which, which, is, which is tough on a masculine of center genderqueer. She'd, she diversified a wee bit too far <laughs> and diversified herself right out of the diversity business <laughs> and round the back into the dead white male business. So she was over. You, uh, you, you can laugh, but no one who matters in our society is laughing. Uh, there are no jokes in, in, in Islam, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, sternly warned. 
But as Sir Tim Hunt and those Queensland students and many others have discovered, uh, there are fewer jokes outside Islam too. Uh, my driver while I was in Cloncurry was a chap called David, and he was talking about how touchy people are today. They're on a hair trigger, ready to find a fence wherever they can. And he mentioned a famous uh, all brand advertisement that most of you have seen over the years, in which they're in the office and some guy's sitting in his cubicle and says, all bran is delicious, and immediately a very tall lady pops up above the cubicle partition and says, I heard that, you said tall Jan is malicious. I prefer Sir Tim Hunt's comedy stylings myself. <laughs> it's not the greatest line, uh, and unlike Sir Tim, uh, all brand paid the most expensive geniuses in the advertising world a gazillion dollars to come up with that. But it, it skewers the touchiness uh, of, of the world we live in today, where people have been incentivized to take offense uh, and then given the state the power to adjudicate that offense, which is really what 18C uh, and Andrew Bolt's case was, uh, was all about. Uh, so it was inevitable that an ad about how touchy people take offense over nothing uh, caused some touchy people to take offense over nothing and to complain to Australia's Advertising Standards Bureau, quote, there exists a widespread general prejudice towards tall young women, <laughs> which irrationally has something to do with the notion that males must be taller than their female partners. This ad would be particularly hurtful to many young and older tall women who have frequently experienced slights relating to their height. The ad is thereby singling out and lampooning in a cruel way a vulnerable group of people. Uh, are there any tall women here tonight? <laughs> so naturally, Kellogg's was tied up for months trying to explain that the purpose of the ad was to promote the idea that all bran is delicious. <laughs> and not that tall women are malicious. <laughs> because they're in the business of selling breakfast cereal, not short women, you know. <laughs> as far as I know, I mean, I don't know whether they've, you know, got some speciality service going on the side, if you're looking for a woman under four foot 11 or something. <laughs> And so a bunch of bureaucrats solemnly investigated all this uh, heightism uh, for a few months and uh, racked up enough o overtime to remodel their vacation homes. And best of all, Australia pioneered a whole new victim group, which is great, because the trick is to find exciting new victim groups for the same old fast-shrinking oppressor group of white men to discriminate against. Uh, a joke a joke is the smallest indicator and most reliable indicator of liberty. Uh, so laugh it up while you can, because there will be no jokes in the future, none. It will be a wasteland of plonking earnestness. Uh, during the final stages of Nelson Mandela's slowly deteriorating health, Neil Phillips, who runs the Crumbs Sandwich Shop in the English town of Rugeley, went online and tweeted, my PC takes so long to shut down, I've decided to call it Nelson Mandela. <laughs> the, the, the Staffordshire Constabulary arrested him, seized his computers, and in the course of an eight-hour detention, fingerprinted and DNA swabbed him. Eight hours in a jail cell for a joke. Not in communist Czechoslovakia, but in England. The Staffordshire Constabulary's joke investigation took so long to shut down, I decided to call it Nelson Mandela. <laughs> you can laugh but no one who matters is laughing. We now live in an age of state ideology. There's a correct position on certain subjects, and it's an ever-growing list. Same-sex marriage, climate change, 
transgender rights, Muslim immigration, millions and millions of people across the Western world now think it perfectly normal that free speech does not extend to these areas, that on these subjects there's only the approved party line and dissenting views not only can't be heard in public, but should not even be expressed in private. And if you're found to have expressed them, it's entirely reasonable that you should lose your job and, if necessary, your liberty. Uh, Bernie Sanders, who may be the next president of the United States, uh, if the... Uh... <laughs> As, uh, as Tony Jones assured me, this is one of those scientifically balanced audiences. <laughs> uh, now, I, I don't like apostasy laws, whether it's for Sharia or for climate Sharia, which are actually remarkably similar religions. <laughs> uh, Barack Obama promises to lower the oceans. ISIS promises a global caliphate. Uh, so far, they're doing a better job than he is. <laughs> The Guardian says Australia will be entirely uninhabitable habitable within a few years. Uh, they said this a few years ago, so you may leave the Park Hyatt and find it's all been washed away while we're having dinner. Uh, so they, the Guardian says Australia will be entirely uninhabitable. Islam for UK says Britain will be under Sharia within a few years. As mayor of Tehran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad had the streets of the city widen for the imminent return to earth of the 12th Imam. As heir to the throne, the Prince of Wales declared the planet is doomed in 96 months unless humanity abandons the evils of capitalism and, quote, the age of convenience. He then got back in his limo and was driven to his other palace. <laughs> Uh, by the way, that 96 months business, he said that 79 months ago. So the bad news is we've got less than a year and a half to go. The good news is that's probably only enough time for another five or six Australian prime ministers. <laughs> uh, a, couple, a couple of months before saying that the jig would be up for us in 96 months, His Royal Highness predicted that the red squirrel would be extinct within 10 years. Uh, which would be April 2019. So uh, if you've got your uh, long-range diary with you, global civilization will collapse in July 2017, and then the red squirrel will get to gamble and frolic in the ruins and rubble for another two years before he's kaput. It's, uh, it's like Planet of the Squirrels. There'll be... There'll be... Uh, There'll be Kevin the Squirrel, and Julia the Squirrel, and Tony the Squirrel, and Malcolm the Squirrel holding bushy-tailed spills for each other's nuts in the rubble of Canberra. <laughs> you know, on balance, predicting the return of the 12th Imam seems marginally less nutty than predicting the end of the world next summer. Uh, What's the difference between Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and the Prince of Wales? One's a deranged millenarian apocalyptic loon, and the other's a respected former president of Iran. <laughs> a joke, a joke is a small thing, but a large, profound loss. And we are living in the dawn of a new age, the end of argument. People no longer want to win the debate, they want to prevent the debate. That's true for Islam, and it's true for climate change. <clears throat> so the science is settled, the theology is settled, and if you disagree, you need to be, as The Guardian recommends for climate deniers, quote, silenced. And if you can't talk about something honestly, Eventually, you lose even the language with which to express a thought about it. The most famous Australian primary school boy on the planet is the seven-year-old boy, he must have turned eight by now, who starred in a tweet from Syria that went viral and neatly summed up the dead end of diversity. As the Australian reported it, 
Quote, Khaled Sharouf's son, a child raised in the suburbs of Sydney, struggles with both arms to hold up the decapitated head of a slain Syrian soldier. A seven-year-old boy, Australian born and bred, but he's proudly holding up the latest severed head in his dad's collection. Uh, Mr. Sharouf was supposed to have been droned last year, uh, but apparently he's been calling pals in Australia from Syria in recent weeks to complain about the government seizing his house in Sydney. He's, he's off beheading people, so it's now a lucrative rental property, uh, and he can use it for negative gearing. Uh, and with the tax savings, he can buy machetes and scimitars, and uh, that's seriously negative gear. Um, so you can see the pressure to reform negative gearing, because if every ISIS jihadist buys a rental property in Sydney, the entire Australian treasury will collapse. Uh, anyway, if you, think, uh, if you think the pictures are uh, appalling, consider the Australian establishment's reaction. Bill Shorten thinks it's a parenting issue. <laughs> Quote, as a parent, I have no idea how you could ever let your child be in that situation. I think that's shocking, the opposition leader said. <laughs> it's, a, it's a parenting issue to Bill Shorten. He doesn't let his seven-year-old play, uh, play with severed heads. He's... Uh, <laughs> He's Labour Party leader, so he's got a closet that's filled with them. He's got Kevins and Julias in there. But he knows you don't let your kid play with the severed head until he's at least 12 or 13, you know. It's a parenting issue. It's a parenting issue. You know, what matters... Uh, in any society is, is, is who makes the noise, who makes the running. And Mr. Shorten also cautioned against attaching any particular significance to that photograph. Quote, I would be careful about using that shocking image, that shocking evil image, and trying to use it for purposes which it shouldn't be used for. It's fascinating to me, this. This is an extraordinary image of Australia, Australia, to present to the world in the year 20. 15, uh, a seven-year-old boy raised in the Sydney suburbs uh, holding up this head. And the leader of the opposition's first reaction is to say, don't talk about it. Be careful what you say about it. Because uh, the government backed off uh, repealing Section 18C, and he's warning you that if you know what's best for you, you'll think twice before suggesting seven-year-old Australian citizens waving around severed heads might be indicative of any broader issues. What matters in any society is who makes the running. And the subtext of that pathetic, awful reaction of Bill Shorten's is to tell you that he's scared too. He's not an idiot. He's leader of the Labour Party, but he's not an idiot. And... <laughs> And, uh, and, he, and he understands deep down somewhere that what he's saying about parenting, federal mandatory parenting to tell you about the right age-appropriate head to let your child play with, he knows that's not what it's about. But his first reaction on seeing that picture is to tell Mr. and Mrs. Australia, don't say a word on the subject. If you know what's good for you, don't say a word on the subject. And he's telling you something about where society is headed. Uh, and where it's headed in the long run is Cologne on New Year's Eve, where mass sexual assault takes place in the main square in the heart of town. And for over a week, every lever of German power, federal politicians, local politicians, law enforcement, state and private media, lie to the citizenry and pretend that no such mass sexual assault ever took place. Because as with Sir Tim Hunt's joke, the reality of that mass sexual assault is at odds with state ideology. Almost every real issue facing us today is hedged in by these considerations. We drift about on the flotsam and jetsam of subjects. We never address the real subjects because we're constrained 
by Bill Shorten and the rest of the political class telling us to be very careful about the bounds between which we hold these conversations. Uh, in the old days, we, we were a culturally confident civilization. We used the expression Western civilization and we meant it, as Martin meant it when he spoke earlier. Mostly on the media, it occurs now as a, as a parodic term. People, if, if, you, if you go on public radio in the United States and people get to call in and, you, and you've mentioned Western civilization, they always quote the famous Gandhi line uh, when he was asked what he thought of Western civilization and he said he thought it would be a good thing. And that was Gandhi's funniest gag. <laughs> And, and all, these, all these public radio listeners, they, they use it as if they think it's the most original line in the world, because Gandhi said it. And Gandhi was very lucky, because he was up against British civil servants, which, you know, when you're, when you're playing video board games of who the really mean villains are, the kids don't say, oh, this time I want to be the British civil servants. <laughs> The fact is that in the old days, we used, to, we used to export progress and prosperity to the rest of the world. And these days, we are in great danger uh, of, the, uh, of the rest of the world exporting tribalism and impoverishment to us. And that's a free speech issue, too. Ultimately, that's a free speech issue. Um, it's interesting to me that there's a big by the way, just with, just with this refugee thing, I'm amazed. I've been watching this Let Them Stay, Let Them Stay, Nauru, PNG, Manus Island, Nauru, Manus Island. You know, nobody ever talks about the fact that this is a business and is a terrific business model. I don't know what it is to get to Australia, but the standard fee for getting someone from the Afghan border... Uh, to Calais in France, where they have the big jungle encampment at the mouth of the Channel Tunnel. Standard fee is $10,000 US. That's to get you through to Peshawar in Pakistan, then over the border into Iran, then up into Turkey, then over to Greece, then over to Italy, into France. There's people making money all, all along the way. $10,000 per person, there's people getting rich on it. And I would like to see on the ABC and other Australian media, I would like to see some profiles of the people who are getting rich on it. The networks are fairly well known, they're fairly open. If you go and hang around in a bazaar in Peshawar, they'll introduce you to the people who are doing this kind of stuff. It's a business, and, the, and, and it's a business, as long as we're incentivizing that business, people are going to come. As long as Western leaders are, are talking about how it's a sign of their moral virtue to let them stay. You know, it's interesting to me, there's a big fuss at the moment about why there are no black people at the Oscars this year. I've heard all these arguments all my life and I couldn't be more bored. So if we're gonna have all these too, too many white people in popular culture controversies, let's at least get a new wrinkle on them. You know there are all these zombie movies these days. Four years ago, there was a film called Cockneys versus Zombies featuring a zombie invasion of the East End and the Cockney pushback. <laughs> you know, I confess, I don't know whether zombies exist, but I know for sure that Cockneys don't. <laughs> zombies are the undead, Cockneys are dead. There's like, uh, you know, a, hand, a handful of any, what, what do they call them, 10 pound poms here tonight. Uh, if, you're, if you're here from the East End, you're the last Cockneys on earth. Uh, in, in the, between 1971 and 2011, uh, the white British share of London's population fell from 86% to 45%. 86%. Now, if you'd been told that the population of, say, Nigeria, uh, it had fallen, you know, if you were told that Rwanda uh, had fallen, the Hutus or Tutsis had fallen from 86% to 45%, you'd have thought that they'd gotten out the old machetes and done something on a scale that made uh, what they did in the 90s look like a picnic. But in the Cockney East End, the uh, Cockney share of the population has fallen either further. The rich and the middle class are hanging on in West London and the outer suburbs, but the Cockney working class 
has fallen by almost three quarters of a million since the beginning of this century. So just to keep the accusations of racism at bay for a couple of minutes, let's keep it all Caucasian. Actually, literally Caucasian, because there's some Chechens in this mix, too. Uh, and maybe even a couple of Dagestanis, too. Uh, the only young white people in the East End today are Romanians, Albanians, and other Eastern Europeans. The only Cockneys left are very old. Some of you will have seen the BBC's number one soap opera, EastEnders, where it's still all Cockney matriarchs, and community life is centered around the pub, the Queen Vic, and it's all about how, uh, you know, I fancied a bit of the old slap and tickle, and how's your father, and I was thinking, sorted, mate. Bob's your uncle, let's all go down the strand, have a banana, but the old trouble and strife fell down the apples and pears and landed on our bristles. In the real world, in the real life East End, that life is only in the graveyards. The pubs are closed. The Duke of Kent is a mosque. The chippies are gone. In the real life borough where East End is, in, is set, white British are down to about 15%. This, this show is ridiculous. Instead of complaining about no black people at the Oscars, people should be claiming about excess white people uh, on sentimental BBC creepy race, race uh, television shows. Um, some of you may remember the sitcom Only Fools and Horses, which the ABC showed in the uh, 80s and 90s. Steve Carell, the big Hollywood star, still wants to do a US version of that show. It's gone, it's dead. Uh, ben Judah, in a fascinating new book on London demography, points out that in Peckham, where that book is set, the white British population is down to 10%, and they're all very old. A real-life East Enders would be about turf wars between Muslims and Romanians. But even our pop culture is dishonest. You know, if the Cockney Sparrow was an actual sparrow, he'd be on the endangered species list today. In Sydney, I was interviewed a week ago about the discrepancies in birth rates between certain, certain suburbs. Uh, Surrey Hills has a fertility rate of a, about 0.78% of a baby per couple. In Lakemba, it's four babies per couple. So you're not going to need to have to worry about lockout laws in Sydney in two generations because there won't be any pubs. Good luck trying to get a drink at three in the afternoon, never mind three in the morning. This is the biggest story of our time, and it's politically incorrect to bring it up. Britain, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia are all in steep demographic decline. Japan now sells as many adult nappies as baby nappies. A poll of British Muslims found that 27% had some sympathy for the motives behind the Shaoli Hebdo attacks. Don't worry, that's only three quarters of a million people, uh, without adding in the 2% who refused to answer. But let's assume, you know, they've just got some mild kind of passive sympathy. The, you know, they're like a lot of us. They're sympathetic, but they don't want to actually get off the uh, sofa and do anything about it. Uh, if France reaches 20% Muslim population, as it will within a few years, uh, you're going to have to get the support of three quarters of the people who are left to have even a bare minimum support uh, in favor of free speech in France. That's the, challenge. That's the challenge we face. It's a free speech issue that too many of us will decide to bite our tongues uh, 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 about this and climate change and all the other issues that face us today, because we don't want to get called racist, or deniers, or sexist, or transphobic, or tall blonde phobic, or whatever the nice next category that's made up. These are the habits of li liberty. And many people seem happy to surrender liberty, as long as it's incremental, and at least initially painless. And there's very little pretense that we're operating from first principles here. The same people who say that race is a social construct demand aboriginal-only computer labs. The same people who say you can't change your sexual orientation say you can say you change your gender. The same people who say mocking Christianity is a sign of a healthy transgressive culture say mocking Islam is grossly culturally insensitive. It's not about a coherent worldview. It's about power. It's about naked power. 
It's as the uh, French theologian Jacques Benin Bossuet, the Bishop of Meaux, said way back in 1691, I have the right to persecute you because I am right and you are wrong. And that is why the Catholic Church in Tasmania has been brought before the Human Rights Commission for teaching a Catholic Church, teaching Catholic doctrine to Catholics is brought before the Tasmanian Human Rights Commission for the same reason that the Bishop of Mo put it back in 1691. Because these days, uh, the church is wrong and their new tormentors are right. It's not about expanding rights, it's about something much cruder. You know, the failure of Mr. Abbott's uh, ministry on Section 18C reminds us of an important truth of Milton Friedman's. Milton used to say, don't wait to elect the right politician to do the right thing. Create the conditions whereby the wrong politicians are forced to do the right thing. And that's what happened to me when I ran afoul of Canada's human rights commissions a few years ago. Uh, my predicament was apparently discussed in Cabinet. And Cabinet all agreed that I was certain to lose because that law that John mentioned had a 100% conviction rate. 100%. Kim Jong-un was envious of it. He said, <laughs> why, why can't our courts be like these Canadian courts? I, I like those odds. And we pushed back against those human rights commissions, and we gave them the worst two years publicity in their history. And by the end of it, it took a long time, and I'd love to have those years of my life back, but Section 13 got repealed. The political... <laughs> not, not, not thanks to the government, but thanks to a private member's bill, like, uh, like Bob Day. Uh, and so there are happy endings out here. They're hard fought. Uh, Rod Kemp uh, mentioned that, that uh, at my, my table uh, this evening, Lady Potter uh, is, uh, is sitting with us, whose husband was the first director of, of the IPA. And I'm sure, you know, everybody thinks when something like the IPA is formed that, uh, oh, we'll all have a bit of fun for a couple of years, and then freedom is, will be secured, and, uh, you know, we can uh, all go back to watching the telly. And it's not like this. It, it never is like that. Uh, freedom requires eternal vigilance and is always there to be fought for. And I, I learned a big lesson from my fight against Section 13, uh, that, that if you push back as hard as the left pushes for its causes, your cause can be won. You can reframe the debate on your terms and you can put them on the defensive. And they are the ones who are saying, no, you can't say that. They're the ones saying, no, that's not funny. They're the ones saying, you have to be banned, you have to be silenced. They're not yet, not yet, going into the offices as they did with Charlie Hebdo and gunning down everybody. But they're on the same continuum of the people who are always arguing for why you have less freedom, why you have to shut up, why you have to be quiet, and why you have to crawl into silence while they get to uh, impose their world on you. And it doesn't have to be like that, but it starts at your level, and it starts with your friends and neighbors, and it starts at the municipal level, and it starts at the primary school level, and, and only Ultimately, does it percolate up to the national and international level? So if all of you vow not to surrender the habits of liberty, to speak freely, to act freely, to live freely, they cannot prosecute us all, uh, and if they decide to go full Charlie Hebdo, they cannot kill us all. Every one of us, every one of us is isolated until he, until he finds that the neighbor across the street agrees with him, or the, the lady at the parent-teacher conference agrees with them. And we won't know, as long as they're just trying to make us all fall silent and not talk about it. When you can speak up, when you can speak freely, you are free to persuade, you are free to find allies. 
And that is what I learned in my Battle of Canada, and that is what I commend to Andrew and to Bob Day and to the others fighting to drive a stake through 18C. And if they do decide to ruin the lives of those students of Queensland University Technology or of the Catholic Church in Tasmania who are doing nothing other than asking for the right uh, to, to, to make the same comments and the same observations uh, that uh, the gay movement and the climate change movement and all the other guys use all the time. If they are foolish enough to ruin their lives, then I'm happy to come back and do to those guys what we did to Section 13 in Canada. If you live freely, if you speak freely, if you act freely, it does not depend on a piece of paper from the government of Australia or any other government. Those are inalienable rights. Use them. Use them every day. Live with them every day. Live, them, live your life in freedom and in liberty, and no stupid act of some transient government can ever take them away from you. Thank you very much indeed.